Hello, everyone, and welcome to Penn Faulkner's third literary conversation of the season, and it's Literature and Literary Conversations Escape. My name is Beth Ann Patrick. I'm the Programs Committee Chair at the Penn Faulkner Foundation, and I'm so excited to have you all here tonight. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, what you need to know, what you should know about the Penn Faulkner Foundation is that we're a nonprofit literary organization based in Washington, D.C., with a mission of celebrating literature and fostering connections between readers and writers to enrich and inspire individuals and communities. We fulfill our mission by administering two national literary awards, the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story, as well as through our education programs, which bring free books and author visits to DC public and public charter schools. Our literary conversation series, which starts its last iteration of the season tonight is on an all new virtual platform. So please let me give you just a couple of notes about the webinar. There will be a short Q&A session at the end of the event. So please submit your questions using the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote a question someone else asks if you were intending to ask the same one and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can in the time we have. We're very proud to have adopted a pay what you will model for our literary conversations in order to increase accessibility to our programs during these tough times. If you are able, please consider making a donation to us through the link we'll put up in the chat. Any amount you give will go directly towards ensuring we can continue to provide high quality programming for our audiences across the country. It's time to get this conversation started and we're so honored to have some amazing panelists tonight for Escape. I just can't wait to tell you about them and you'll see them on your screens in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to go alphabetically by author and then introduce our moderator. First, Margaret Atwood, whose novels include The Handmaid's Tale and The Testaments, is also a poet whose new collection, Dearly, was released this month. And Margaret's one of the few figures in 20th and 21st century writing who is just as amazing a poet as a novelist. So I hope if you get a chance, you'll check out Dearly and maybe want a copy of that for your own. Rian Amalkar Scott, who lives here in DC, had a debut collection that came out, The World Doesn't Require You, and that reimagines the history of a small Maryland town, very much like the one he grew up in. He has a story called Shape Ups at Delilah's in this year's Best American Science Fiction um, Anthology. Nisi Shaw writes speculative fiction as well, and their 2017 novel, Everfair, is an alternate history of Nigeria. This year, she's edited an amazing anthology called New Sons, Speculative Fiction by People of Color, and definitely another volume to check out. Now, last but not least is our moderator, Morgan Jerkins. She has a new book called Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots, and Morgan also has a debut novel coming out in early 2021 called Call Baby. It's going to be a must read of 2021, I am sure. So with that introduction and without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Morgan Jerkins and we're all going to be involved in a conversation about escape that I think will be enlightening and entertaining. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you so much, Bethann. Thank you so much to all of you who decided to join us tonight to focus on the theme topic of escape, which during these unprecedented times is very prescient, I may say. So to start us off, I thought that we would start with a reading from all each from um, our panelists. Um, so Nisi, would you mind starting us off? Not at all. Um, I'm going to be reading from Kinning, which is the sequel I'm working on to Everfair. Um, and it's uh, from the viewpoint of one character that was 
that has that was also in Everfair, uh, Tink, um, a Chinese-born uh, railway worker who becomes an inventor and engineer in Everfair, uh, and he's up to something a little more nefarious in this uh, section. I will also say that I usually. I, I made a vow to sing whenever I read. So I'm just gonna do a short two bar piece here. We're sending out a major love and this is our message to you. Between the homes of collaborators clustering near the palace's walls, they walked quickly, quietly, avoiding the treacherous gravel-strewn entrances of the more elegant establishments. Then these were left behind. Removing their lone light sponge from his shirt, Tink lowered it to soak in a puddle of water and activate. He squeezed out the excess water and returned it to its former home, his body and clothes serving as its shade. They should not rely on their eyes alone. It would be best to frame their perception in the fashions nourished by the spirit medicine while on this mission. Soon the tingling air of the woods encroached more closely and soon after that it enveloped them. Tink wanted to rest here to lie among the enchantingly damp fallen leaves as if he too had come to the exact right place. But the road, the mission, the spores, the target, at last they'd reached the target. Fragrant new turned earth steaming with life sat wetly mounded over the trench in which the cable traveled from its landing station in the bay to the terminal house on the forest's far side. He waited for Ragu, who lagged behind the twins and their captive. Tools, he asked. From a sling over his left shoulder, the man removed a pair of collapsed shovels. Unfolding the one handed to him, Tink sank it into the soil. He directed the Baratis to start digging a few paces further from the road. The actions he performed were pleasurable, sinking in the shovel's blade, lifting out the muck of knowledge, heaping it up next to one serenely expectant hole after another. He couldn't delve too deeply. The hole's round sides wanted to melt and sag but the spores emerging tendrils would sense their goal and stretch down to reach it. Thank you so much, Nisi. Rian? Okay, so I'm going to, I'm gonna read the first story in my, in my second collection, uh, The World Doesn't Require You. Um, it's called uh, David Sherman, The Last Son of God. Um, so I was, I was challenged to write a, a story um, using a uh, already pre-existing character. So I, I used, uh, I used God. <laughs> and it starts with a quote um, from the Lincoln Catechism. Thou shalt have no other God but the Negro. God is from Cross River. Everyone knows that. He was tall, lanky, wore dirty brown clothes and walked with a limp he tried to disguise as a bop. His chin held a messy salt and pepper beard that extended to his Adam's apple, always clutching a mango in his hand. Used to live on the south side, down under the bridge, near the water. Now there's a nice little sidewalk and flowers and a bike trail that leads into Port Yuga. Back then, there was just mud and weeds, and he'd sit there barefooted, softly preaching his word. At one time, he had 100, maybe 200, some say up to 500 or even a thousand people listening. But the time I'm talking about, he'd sit with only one or two folks, always with a mango, except during Easter time when he'd pass out jelly beans to get people to stop and listen. He lived on the banks of the Cross River until one day he filled his pockets with stones and walked into the water and sank like a crazy poet. He wasn't insane. It was all part of God's plan. Last time he was crucified, this time drowned. Anyway, God can't drown. He'll come back, perhaps to oversee the writing of another testament or to judge the living and the dead, whatever he feels. 
This story, though, isn't about God. It's about one of his sons, not his son in the metaphorical sense. Well, he was, as we are all the children of God, but more so, he was his son in the physical sense. David Sherman was God's last son, the youngest of 13. Five different women had lined up to sire the children of God. They were all boys except for the fifth, a disappointment with the age of 25, seduced her 15-year-old brother with their shapely behind and left Maryland to build a sinful life with him. God could have had more children, but he got a message from himself after David was born to stop spilling his seed into his servants. Who was he or anyone else to argue? David lived with his mother, Violet, in a one-bedroom apartment on Sally Street that teemed with water bugs and mice, but rarely any rats. God slept there sometimes, but not very often. He'd rise long before the sun, and he'd tell his boy, God morning to you, son. David would reply, and God morning to you, too. He stopped spending the night after David turned 12. To David, God was a disappointment. God told his son things from time to time, things about virtue and the coming Holy Ghost Testament, but never anything David could understand. He wondered if one day he'd lose his mind and be out on the street speaking an incomprehensible gospel like his old man. And when David was 16, God took his own life. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Last but not least, Margaret. You're on mute. There we go. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Those were very interesting and made me want to read the books. And that's what should have happened. <laughs> so this is uh, the beginning of the Testaments. The speaker is of uh, Aunt Lydia, who uh, we know from The Handmaid's Tale as being really quite unpleasant. Uh, but now she is speaking herself. She's still unpleasant. <laughs> Only dead people are allowed to have statues, but I have been given one while still alive. Already I am petrified. This statue was a small token of appreciation for my many contributions, said the citation, which was read out by Aunt Vidala. She had been assigned the task by our superiors and was far from appreciative. I thanked her with as much modesty as I could summon, then pulled the rope that released the cloth drape shrouding me. It billowed to the ground, and there I stood. We don't do cheering here at Ardua Hall, but there was some discreet clapping. I inclined my head in a nod. My statue is larger than life, as statues tend to be, and shows me as younger, slimmer, and in better shape than I've been for some time. I am standing straight, shoulders back, my lips curved into a firm but benevolent smile. My eyes are fixed on some cosmic point of reference, understood to represent my idealism, my unflinching commitment to duty, my determination to move forward despite all obstacles. Not that anything in the sky would be visible to my statue, placed as it is in a morose cluster of trees and shrubs beside the footpath running in front of Ardua Hall. We ants must not be too presumptuous, even in stone. Clutching my left hand is a girl of seven or eight, gazing up at me with trusting eyes. My right hand rests on the head of a woman crouched at my side, her hair veiled, her eyes upturned, and an expression that could be read as either craven or grateful, one of our handmaids. And behind me is one of my pearl girls, ready to set out on her missionary work. Hanging from a belt around my waist is my taser. This weapon reminds me of my failings. Had I been more effective, I would not have needed such an implement. The persuasion in my voice would have been enough. <coughs> that was nine years ago. 
Since then, my statue has weathered. Moment here. Pigeons have decorated me. Moss has sprouted. <coughs> In my damper crevices. Votaries have taken to leaving offerings at my feet, eggs for fertility, oranges to suggest the fullness of pregnancy, croissant to reference the moon. I ignore <coughs> the breadstuffs. Usually they have been rained on, but pocket the oranges. Oranges are so refreshing. <laughs> Thank you so oh. much, Margaret. <laughs> um, oh. Aunt Lydia is quite old. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, Rihanna, also Nisi, for your reading selections. Um, the way I want to start off is just what I think is most pressing on everyone's mind is the pandemic. You know, we're now at a moment where over 250,000 American lives have been lost. There's been rampant negligence by the outgoing administration. And I'm wondering as speculative fiction writers, those who look towards the future and also towards the past, how has this unprecedented time make you rethink, reconsider, or maybe reconfigure any of your stories or things that, or stories that you're thinking of writing but might have changed because of the times? Yeah, I think it's it's been a it's been a, a a huge emotional roller coaster this 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 whole thing. I mean, I, my my view on it and and how I'm approaching my work is just it, it changes month by month. You know, initially I initially I think as a reaction to everything that I felt I lost, I was I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into this and I'm gonna write about this. And I started I, I threw everything thing to the side and I started writing a novel um about <laughs> that was directly related but everything started changing so dramatically and rapidly day to day um and it it, it was you know it, it just it just struck me it just made me realize that this thing is so big that it needs time to digest you know and i i need to actually um think about it so 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 i i, I wisely put put the the pandemic novel um to the side um you know the horrible pandemic novel i was writing to the side and um and, and just decided i was going to sit back and observe mm. yeah i i have not uh included the pandemic itself in anything that i'm working on it's definitely changed the way that i work mm. um, but it has not uh contributed to my storyline although what I'm what I'm writing about is is a sort of a, an infectious empathy. So so having an infection going on in my novel, there's all sorts of tugs from reality pulling the story in different ways. Um, the next short story I'm working on um, called uh, "A Merman I Should Turn to Be," uh, and that has. Um, it's been shaped by one of the effects of the pandemic, which is um, the highlighting of the destruction of Black lives by uh, people in authority uh, in the US, at least. Um, and so, uh, and the movement for reparations, that's, I'm, I'm using that in that story, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh, you're wondering about me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think I'm older than everybody on this panel. <laughs> hey. uh, so I'm I'm wondering how many people uh, remember the time when there were just about no vaccinations that you could get. Um, so quarantine was just kind of normal, and people were afraid of polio and smallpox. And diphtheria. I had four cousins die of diphtheria, and whooping cough, and um, and German measles, and and on and on. And it was the 50s that brought in a lot of those vaccinations. 
And I'm also old enough to have parents who went through the 1919 flu, which was really uh, spectacular. Killed a huge number of people and some of them very rapidly. They would, they would collapse on the street and blood would come out of their ears, if you can imagine. Um, so, and people were just not, they weren't ready for that one either. And uh, since time we've, that time we've had SARS, but that was fairly contained. Uh, it had a pretty short incubation period and people got onto it pretty quickly. Um, but we've also been really worried about things like Ebola and Marburg. Um, so this is, it's, it's not a new thing, um, pandemics. Uh, if you look in, in the Bible, you'll find some. And if you look back at Greek history, you'll find the mention. We're not sure what they were, but they killed a lot of people. And then there was the 14th century with the great mortality, which killed half the population of Europe. And on this continent, they figured that probably 90% of the original inhabitants who had no immunity to European diseases were wiped out. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not um, a new thing for humans, but it's new for this generation. Mm -hmm. So it's really new for kids who had the vaccinations, weren't afraid of you know, getting um, polio or diphtheria or any of those things because, because there were vaccines for them. So mm -hmm. it's been very shocking for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the really, that the pandemic novels when they come are gonna come from a generation younger than mine. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I've already wrote a pandemic trilogy, but it was a somewhat different kind. It was much more thorough and it was man-made. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty scary too, because we as human beings do have the capability to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's the that's the field, and if you talk to the epidemiologists and the historians, they will point out that way many more people have been killed by contagious diseases than have been killed in in direct combat and in warfare. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a human thing, and guess what? Mm -hmm. We're human. Right. So we're right. Happy to yeah one of the biblical references that i thought of when i was reading some of your interviews miss atwood was you know there's nothing new under the sun everything that we're going through now has yeah. an historical precedent and so for those of you you know if a part of the panel even if it's not a pandemic that you've seen before or the flu mm -hmm. any other types of, of you know barriers oppression terrible administrative laws yes we've done it all Right. And I'm wondering, you know, does that make you feel a bit of disillusionment? And if it does, does that ever affect your writing? No, you know? it does not. Because along with those stories, which are terrible stories, and, uh, you know, go back to World War II, which killed more people than any war we know about ever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and awful things went on, um, you know, the camps and the uh, you know, pe people who were who had disabilities just being killed by the Nazis, and and on and on. Um, there's also at the same time these stories of astonishing um, courage, astonishing heroism, um, people combating those those things, people helping. Uh, so, so no, it doesn't. It's it's not because it's not all one sided. And if it were all one sided, we would not be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. well, Morgan, your your quotation um, is actually um, it, it's I included in in New Suns. There is nothing new under the sun. Um, this is from Octavia Butler. But yes, there are new suns. So. Yes, these stories and uh, these events are a repetition of uh, the flu pandemic in particular is on my mind. Um, and our reactions to them can be different, can be, can be changed, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully for the better, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> Rihanna, did you have anything you want to add? Um, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I think that 
you know, we've weathered these, we've weathered these things before and we weather, um, we, we weather, you know, like you, like you said, horrible, uh, you know, administrative, um, failures, um, you know, and, uh, um, you know, some people won't weather. Some people will, 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 will not survive a lot of these things that we've, uh, we, we've, uh, that have been foisted upon us and that we've foisted upon ourselves. Um, but, um, I think, I think one thing, uh, you know, I was thinking of, you know, the, you know, good things that, that have come out of this, you know, I, you know, I necessarily had to think and say, and think back and say, what positive has come out of this, <laughs> you know? Um, and you know, I, I think from small things, you know, um, to, to to large things, I, I think a lot of us have have been able to look into ourselves and become um, more introspective and, and get to know ourselves a lot better. And I think as a society, um, you know, I, it's 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 going to allow things to fall away that that are not serving us. And hopefully, we're smart enough to be able to um, to move in a, in a in a better direction. So. You know, I don't think I, you know, we, we necessarily have time to be um, disillusioned uh, and more so think, you know, we have to think about a lot of the, the, the positive, you know, what, whatever positive uh, can come out of this, um, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to pivot a little bit because I want to talk about the intersection of two topics that are very pressing to me personally. It's um, advanced technology and exploitation. And the reason why I wanted to talk to you all about it is because you all, you know, you all explore it in your works. And I'm thinking about now, we're thinking about just Amazon, these new robot dogs that they have coming out. And I literally saw an episode of Black Mirror, if any of you seen that, that talked about robot dogs. It was very scary. And so I wanted to talk about it, particularly in your work, when you talk about the perils of this, yes, we're advancing, but what is at odds? Like, how do you do that in your fiction where you're trying where you know that capitalism has you know it's a part of our lives and it's something that we can't 100 percent disentangle ourselves from how do you think your fiction mitigates that or explores that i'll i'll go <laughs> how does my fiction uh mitigate uh the dangers inherent in uh the expansion and a growth of technology it gives uh it gives it new stories to to follow um it, it gives it um i i try to write really hopeful stuff so um for instance in everfair um technology is actually kind of a hero people are using microscopes to look at at uh at, at uh, micro, microorganisms, um, they're using, because they're in a landlocked country, Everfair is landlocked, um, they use uh, what they call air canoes to uh, do trade routes. Um, they have uh, guns that throw knives and, and they um, steal plans for um, guns that, that can do this like as, a, as if they were machine guns. Um, so it's just a question of um, who is telling the story and uh, who who benefits from it that that I I concern myself with. I don't concern myself with like saying that technology is bad. Technology is part of the story. Yeah, technology is definitely not bad. You know, the book the book is a technology, right? <laughs> and, and that's yeah. made our lives so much better. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think we always have to think about where, um, you know, how, how much, how much of, uh, what parts of us is going to be in the technology. I was, re I was, uh, you know, I've written two robot stories in my, in, in my books and I'm writing another robot story right now, but I'm, I'm thinking about even, even if this, the technology eventually separates itself from us in some, in, in some distant future, its origin is us, right? And we have to, and um, we have to start thinking about, you know, are we are we replicating, you know, systems systems of oppression? Are we represent are we replicating racism? You know, like a like you know, there are all these stories about how, you know, they've programmed AI and the AI turned racist. And it's not AI is inherently racist. It's that you, the the people are not really thinking. People who programmed in the beginning weren't really thinking about some of the implications of of it learning from. Um, people who are are putting out racist ideas. Um, I was reading an article today about 
perhaps in the future AI coming up with, you know, the ever elusive um, theory of everything, uh, and how, um, how and how uh, you know it's uh, it's, it's going to be based on you know uploading the uh, the ideas of 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 us of people uh, of of the the great thinkers and the great minds or whatever. Um, but you know we have to think about how we're uploading our blind spots uh, as 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 humanity and that's what i think our stories are are should should be should be thinking about and, and it's not necessarily saying technology is bad you know it should be saying you know we you, you really have to think about the implications of you know what parts of humanity are going to be in this technology the algorithms the algorithms need to be uh, seen as stories right they're not neutral, you know. They're they're they they really are not are not neutral. Um, even if the people who program them and, and you know initially said you know these things are it's math, uh, or it's a it's a series of steps. The series series of steps is, is is really based in what um what we know and what we understand and the limit and our limits as well. Well, well, um, going back to Marshall McLuhan, who said. Any human technology is an extension of what we want to do, what we do and want to do. So uh, binoculars and cameras are an extension of our eyes, and radio is an extension of our, our voice and ears, uh, and so on. So it is all, it is all stuff we want, because um, if we were giant spiders, we wouldn't be wanting those things, we would be wanting super delicious flies and you know better webs and things like that but we we are not um giant spiders yet so the things we the technologies we invent are all things that human beings want to do the catch is that not everything that human beings want to do is super delicious wonderful good um, and the other catch is that that any technology beginning with fire um, anything we come up with always has a good side, a bad side, and a third side I call the stupid side of things we didn't anticipate. So some side effect we hadn't even thought about, and they all have that. So a hammer, you can um, build a house with it, you can kill somebody with it, and you can use it in a game show. <laughs> 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 who even would have thought of that when inventing the hammer? Uh, so, so that's who we are, and we we kind of can't avoid that. And I guess the best thing we can do is be aware of that, the fact that any technology we, we come up with is going to have a less desirable side to it and another side we didn't even see coming. So when they invented the Internet, it was scientists who said, won't it be great that we can communicate our wonderful scientific ideas of themselves in real time. Yes, let's go for it. And now look. And now look. <laughs> so some really good things and some really terrible things. Mm -hmm. You just saw the latest election and all the, um, well, I call them lies. Um, why not? All the lies that were circulated around via the, the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, Nisi, I wanted to go back to something that you just said, algorithms have stories or should have stories. Can you elaborate? Because that's a very powerful line there. Well, I, I tend to think that, uh, that people, that humans need stories and we find them in everything. And uh, so uh, algorithms are stories and should be seen as stories. Um, the algorithm that says, uh, you will be reaching out for and um, anticipating trouble from people who are in a certain neighborhood. That is a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a story based on um, past experience. Um, but whose past experience? Who, who was telling the story? Um, because uh, if you had someone else telling that story, the trouble might have been seen to arise in a different neighborhood or based on something besides geographical location, such as uh, income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that 
you know, I can segue into my next question talking about ambition or the limits of ambition, because another thing that I found in your works is that there are these individuals who have these grandiose ideas. They have this intention to improve society or improve it for a certain sect. And then as Margaret said, there are some unforeseen uh, things that begin to take place. And, you know, we often find in stories like this, that like many people are harmed. And so I'm wondering, you know, as, as you're continuing to create, um, do you think that there's a way to, again, mitigate that? Like, do you think that there's a way where we can have boundless ambition where you're not inadvertently hurting certain groups of people? So how to make humanity better? <laughs> Uh, send shivers up my spine uh, because the the big totalitarian dictatorships of the 20th century all began as utopias. Mm. So they all came in saying, we're going to make things just so much better. Trust yeah. us, we're going to make things so much better, but first we have to get rid of those people. Mm -hmm. And there's always been a those people in those schemes. Mm -hmm. And um, excuse me for saying so as a Canadian, but the the great American Western expansionism was kind of the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, say? there were there was a, those people, mm -hmm. and uh, and Canada was no different except that the, those people were different uh, from the other those people, and that those people move around depending on what you what country you're in and who's feeling uh, in an empire building uh, mode, but they're mm -hmm. they're always. Um, there's always a promise of more, better, greater, more wonderful, more perfect. And there always seems to be this um, undesirable side of, of who you have to get rid of first. Mm -hmm. Get rid of or control or, you know, dispense with or put somewhere else. Um, you can see that uh, in, in these schemes. So I, I tend to worry about utopias. And anybody who's, who's read a lot of um, in the field of speculative fiction knows that the 19th century was a great producer of utopias and then that turned and in the 20th you're going to get a lot more uh, bad societies than, than good ones being written about because people lost faith in the infinite betterment of everything because they'd, uh. they'd seen people promise it and then um, fail spectacularly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so but but you can't you can't give up wanting to do better that's mm -hmm. that's not good either mm -hmm. yeah. just, you sink into corruption so wanting to do better but possibly not with a grand scheme that involves getting rid of those people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the things that we've seen uh, uh, in the last I don't know I don't know how many years is 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 the the idea that um, that we can just focus on um, science and math and and, uh, and and technology and and not think about implications that that history and and literature um, have always thought about um, and I think that um, you know if you're if you're taking out um, if you're demonizing or mocking or you know the 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 humanities then you, then you're gonna have problems and i think we, we we've seen that i think um you know we see people who don't really know or understand that they're the 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 implications of, of what they do they they, they have these uh, these theories and, and slogans you know move fast and break everything and um we have to disrupt and disrupt without thinking about the implications of of, of what that disruption does uh, and thinking about ways that will, you're going to mitigate it. These things have been have been predicted. <laughs> These things have been um, have been thought about. The ethics, the uh, you know they've you know people are discussing them. Uh, but if you take that out, if you ignore that, if you if you if you cultivate people that don't have any appreciation of that, then you're going to have problems. And I, and I think that's one of the things that we we've seen. Mm -hmm. Both of both uh, my novel Everfair and the one I'm working on, the sequel Kinning, are about uh, would-be utopias. Uh, in in uh, the first one, uh, in Everfair, uh, there are these uh, 
well, I, the Fabian socialists uh, get together with a bunch of uh, Christian missionaries, uh, right? <laughs> I can see Margaret face palming, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, of, of course there's uh, upheaval and, and uh, clashing when they, when they each try to promulgate their own version of what utopia would be. In this uh, one that I'm working on now, um, there are actually two sort of super organisms. Um, I won't say much more than that, um, but each, each one of these is supposedly key to a certain kind of utopia. Um, I like to have people striving for a utopia and not getting there. And I think that that's the best case scenario is that you mm -hmm. are trying, you want to make things better and you fail, but hopefully that's a good failure. But yeah. how, how badly do they fail? Ah, uh, you mean badly in, as in terms of how, how many casualties? Uh, well, badly in terms of the collapse of the Third Reich. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, they, they never get that far. <laughs> well, they don't. that's good. <laughs> so they, they have they have moments of sadness and self-realization, but they don't want to burn Paris to the ground. Right, exactly. Uh, or if they do want to, they can't. It's they too can't. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, I want to direct these questions particularly to Rian and Nisi, uh, just regards to Black history and speculative fiction. Because, for example, Nisi, with Everfair, you're talking about the Belgian Congo, you're talking about colonialism, stuff that even many people today are discovering the magnitude of how terrible it was. And with Rihanna, when I read your book, I'm thinking about all Black towns, and I'm thinking about how many of them don't exist anymore. Anymore. Anymore, mm -hmm. yeah, anymore. Um, and I'm wondering, because we're still discovering things about Black history. Sophia Cartman calls it the silence of the archive. How do you, you know, maintain sensitivity to so many things you might not be able to know while also breaking out and trusting your imagination at the same time? Yeah, I, I found my imagination is not as wild as I, as I thought it was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many things that, that, that I've written and... Um, you know, I, I, they, 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 they are real. They, they, they've actually happened. Um, for instance, um, you know, my neighborhood um, was founded by um, the neighborhood I grew up in, um, or parts of the neighborhood I grew up in was, were founded by a, a freedman. Um, and I didn't know this when I started my project. My, 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 my stories are all are founded in this, uh, in this, um, this town that was founded after a slave revolt. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that. And then, and there's this bridge in my neighborhood that was, uh, that, that separates the, uh, that, that, that historically had separated the, the, the black side of the town, which I, which is, you know, where I grew up in and, um, and the, and the, and the white side of the, the white side of the town. And, you know, I, I didn't know this, you know, I, I wrote about a bridge, you know, it was in my excerpt that I read, um, you know, but I, I, you know, I think, you know, I always knew that, you know, that the, the they had problems with us crossing the bridge. I didn't know that it was it was rooted in 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 a, in a history, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I think that um, there are things that we feel um, that we um, that I think we're going to keep discovering um, when I when I when I write the a lot of times when I when, when we write these things that that are um, that that are imagined. Um, I think that, and, and then the archive becomes, start speaking. Um, I, I think that, um, th that, you know, I, our work is, our work is, 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 a, is a comment, becomes a comment on, 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 on what we don't know and what, what we don't know consciously, but what we know intuitively. Mm -hmm. We know more than we know. And, and I think your your book speaks to that, Morgan. Your book speaks to that about how we we know more than we know. Um, your your last book and and how we we feel it. Um, and it's um you know it's uh um and, and it guides us. 
as you know through throughout our throughout our journey yeah yeah i don't know i i think i come at it the other of the other way actually i'll be doing all of all of this research and and uh that will spark my imagination rather than imagining things and then saying oh whoa that actually happened so wow wow and this question is for you margaret i mean you have a legion of fans you probably have more legion of fans with the handmaid's tongue hulu millennials and perhaps gen Zers too and so I'm wondering, you know, ever since, you know, the Handmaid's Tale has come out on Hulu and I'm not going to lie, I saw tweets, there was a, there was a rumor months ago that there was going to be a vaccine coming out with a company named Gilead. A lot of feminist friends were freaking out about it. <laughs> it was, it was bizarre. It was kind of spooky, but it was kind of bizarre. And I'm wondering, do you feel like if you get any fan mail, if you talk to any feminists that they perhaps depend on you a little bit too much for like to guide us to like be like a seer and to help us into the future or anything like that. Okay, so nobody's perfect. Yeah. Um, these are my feet, clay, you know, <laughs> ball got feet of clay. Uh, so let's dial back in time uh, to when I, when I first wrote The Handmaid's Tale. So we had had uh, second wave feminism, which, which became public about 68, 69, and had a very energetic run in the 70s, and then kind of fell apart. Um, there was some infighting, people got tired, uh, but gains had been made, particularly in, the, in, in laws. So laws had been changed, gains had, gains had been made, um, powers had been acquired that hadn't been there before. You could get a mortgage. <laughs> hey, uh, you could have a credit card. Wow, stuff like that. Um, but it was, it was far from over. And then in the 80s, there was a backlash. So we had the election of of Ronald Reagan, we had the appearance of a certain kind of so-called religious uh, right who started saying the kinds of things they thought should happen. And um, having read Mein Kampf, Hitler's book, mm -hmm. which people were saying, oh, he's just fun and you know, <laughs> he's not going to do any of that wrong. I, I think people do say what they would like to have happen. I think when somebody says they want to cut off Dr. Fauci's head and put it on a pike, they would probably do that if they had the chance. I'm, I believe that. I believe people when they say those things. So they started saying these things about women, and I thought, well, if you want to, if you think women's place is in the home, but they're all out, they're all running around out there having jobs and bank accounts and stuff, how are you going to get them back in the home? How do you dial it back? And second question, if you're going to run a scheme like this, under what flag, as it were, would you run it? Would you say, hi, my name is Bill, I'm a communist, you should all follow me? Not likely in the United States. They wouldn't get enough adherence. But if you said, this is the will of God, a lot of people would put up their hands for that. Um, it is still um, a nation that was founded in the 17th century, and a big part of those founders were the 17th century Puritans, and it was not a fun time for women in that time and place. So I built the book on that in the, in the 1980s, and then I thought we would move away from that. I thought we were moving away from it in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, Iron Curtain went down, hooray, hooray, it's all gonna be global, we'll just go shopping. Um, history is at an end, all of that was wrong. Um, everything just went underground and then along came 9-11, big shock. Along came the financial collapse 2008, big shock. Those kinds of things make people scared and angry. And when that happens, you have a populism or uh, 
you, you move back towards the right and, um, and then you know it happened. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, The Henry's Tale started being filmed as a series in 2016 before the election. We were in the middle of filming it when the election happened. Nothing changed. The scripts did not change. The series launched in 2017, and instead of it being a fantasy of something that didn't happen and wasn't going to happen, and a dodge the bullet, uh, thank heavens for that. That was that was not um, the atmosphere that the series uh, appeared in. So instead of being viewed as a fun escapist romp, <laughs> It was viewed as here it comes, uh -huh. and and I think it was a confluence of events, none of which I had any control over. So I didn't do it, uh, but but that was the result, and that's what made it such a phenomenon. And I'm and I'm not happy to say that. Yeah. Because if I had a choice, you know, things could have been otherwise, and then it would have been a fun a fun version of something that didn't happen um if i could have that choice i'd take it wow you know wow wow that is that's not a response i expected because you know writers a lot of times writers like I, I'm, I'm glad i want my project to succeed i want it to reach unimaginable heights but now mm -hmm. you're having this thought where you're like not really it still would have succeeded because it's a good show Mm -hmm. but, it, but it would have been viewed differently. So mm -hmm. the frame around it, mm -hmm. um, the frame around it was was uh, created by the history that actually happened. Absolutely. And you all know, because you're writers and readers, you all know that the way we we view any work of art, there's always a frame uh, through which we're looking at that, mm -hmm. and and that and that frame can change. Mm -hmm. So something that we might have thought was just wonderful when we were 16, uh, at a somewhat later date, we may think, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> I have a different frame now, I'm seeing it differently. Mm -hmm. And that happens to all of us, and it, and it, and it keeps on happening. And mm -hmm. that's good, because if it didn't keep on happening, the work would be static, and so would our frame. Mm -hmm. Everything would just be paused in time. Absolutely. Wow. And just piggyback and what off what you were saying about believe people what they say. I'm thinking about the power of language, especially under the Trump administration. And I'm thinking about your work as well as Rion's work. And Nisi, you can definitely jump in here with the fall of liberal arts institutions or the precariousness of liberal arts institutions. It's been talked about in the Chronicles, it's talked about in the Atlantic. And I'm thinking about the proliferation of fake news, or again, when people don't believe the information that's been spread to them. And as, as you call those writers and readers, do you often sit back and just like, I told you so, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> when people don't read the books or people don't read their history or things like that. No, we've been there before. <laughs> So part of, part of World War II and part of World War I, as far as that went, and part of the lead up to World War II, it was all propaganda, big propaganda wars going on. Um, there's a difference in the way it's disseminated now, but the intention is the same. So either to get people believing something that is not true or to confuse them so much that they don't know what to believe. And that was the stated aim of the Russian dis disinformation campaign in, in um, the 2016 election. So confused people so much. Is this true? Is that true? Is this other thing true? Is this other thing true? Who can tell me? I just, I'm not gonna believe any of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have just stepped mm. back from the category called truth. Uh, but that's not a good answer either. <laughs> In fact, why did, you, why did I even say either? That's not a good answer. Uh, so we need to get back to who's going to level with us. Who are the trusted sources? 
I, I tend to trust uh, sources that have an address because you can sue them. <laughs> so if they get if they get too far off it, uh, you can call them out and, and that might actually have an effect. Whereas if it's somebody pretending to be a rabbit on social media, you've got no idea. You've got no idea who that person is or and or whether they're just pretending to be a crazy lunatic to, to make other people look bad. You just don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is a real crisis in critical thinking in our in our country. Um, and in the world, I think, um, and, and I think a lot of it stems back to, you know, the idea that um, that the acquiring knowledge has to have a purpose, you know, it has to have a, a, a goal, you know, um, it, it, a capitalistic goal. Um, and it has to, you know, it, it's only worthwhile if it's going to make your life, um, if it's if it's going to get you a job. And that becomes a, you know, that becomes a, a real problem because then people are only uh, interested in acquiring the knowledge that going to, you know, immediately lead them to, you know, lead them to, to something the next day, something, you know, a job the next day. Um, and so it becomes about training rather than about thinking. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we are, we're seeing we're seeing the fruits of, of that. We're seeing, you know, a, a, a love of a love of, of conspiracy thinking. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we're seeing people uh, like, like Margaret said, throwing up their hands. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to believe. We're seeing a lot of people, um, with, you know, with this false uh, uh, equivalency. Oh, both both sides are are, are wrong. Uh, and, you know, without without thinking about um, the you know the you know the moral dimension of of, of what um, uh, of, of of any issue. When we think about the moral dimension of an issue it becomes more so like a um, the uh, the strategy works, then it's right, and um, and you know um, I, I think it all has its roots in 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 not um, not focusing on 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 thinking. Mm -hmm. well, well, you're worried about educational institutions, um, but they're not the only places where thinking can take place. Mm -hmm. so educational institutions toss out the humanities. Uh, that will not destroy them, or it will not destroy the kinds of, you know, it won't destroy people writing books, it won't destroy people reading books, it won't destroy people talking about books. Um, you watch, supposing there were none left, somebody would invent one, or two, or three, or five. I don't, I don't think that critical, I don't expect critical thinking from people, from any people. If it happens, it's a bonus, but I don't expect it. <laughs> um, and I have several friends that are completely outside critical thinking, uh, and and uh, including in that several friends who I've met personally, who I know, who are Trump supporters, okay? And I mean, they are like all about Trump. Uh, and and uh, one of them, uh, you know, I, I stay in touch with them via social media. One of them posted uh, some something about how all the Democrats want to do is like mess up the world and kill babies and drink blood. And I said, uh oh, hello, you who me here. I'm I'm a Democrat. Uh, and then she said, well, not you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. What now, does that have to do with critical uh, thinking? Where does the blood drinking come in? You what, know, I, I missed that part, and I'm a vegetarian, so... Oh, my God. So we, are we back in the land of vampires, or is there some other plot going on here? What, I really what, don't know where she got her, her meme from, but it, it was like, uh, it was totally not about thinking rationally. So it was about name-calling. Um, so, so really, probably what you should, what one ought to ask people who are going way over the top like that is, what are you afraid of, really? Mm. What are you really afraid of? What do you think people are going to take away from you? Uh, do you really fear that they're going to drink your blood? Is that it? <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> this is someone who um, I can talk with her about other things. We yeah. can talk 
about ferrets, for example. Ferrets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> ferrets. Ferrets drink blood. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> no. I don't know. But uh, anyway, that is that is my illustration of like that is not something that I am looking for from from people that I interact with. It's nice when it happens, um, and it is. Um, I would no really, more... yeah. I would really like to be able to follow the path of thinking. You know, the the path is sort of the lily pads hopping from <laughs> one another. Like how they got there. What what was the big yeah the appeal i mean a lot of these ideas i'm sorry yeah go ahead yeah a lot a lot of these ideas like the blood drinking they sound like repurposed the anti-semitic tropes you know oh, yeah. um and and all that they start and it starts in dehumanization yeah it's definitely dehumanization and um what this person fears that's a very good question margaret um i will try and and uh find out more about that uh by the way this is <laughs> jewish observant mm, mm. right wow. i know you, you so, keep dropping in like another mic drop just <laughs> another one man um so we're gonna get into the q a portion because we have a lot of questions from some super fans um ben pitfield for margaret he asks you are a prominent writer of both fiction and poetry. How does your approach to writing differ depending on the genre you're working in? And does your framing of the world differ between mediums? Wow. Okay. Let's talk about wave patterns. <laughs> so take a novel. So the wave patterns are, are quite, quite um, long and, um, you know, separated. So the peaks of the waves are separated. So something may come up on page um, 50 that has a reprise on page 170 that then has another reprise on page 390. So the waves like that. Short stories, the waves are closer together. Um, it's a more condensed form. And lyric poetry, is, it's even more condensed. But it's also probably closer um, at the brain activity level to, to music, I would say. Um, that's lyric poetry. I'm not talking about epic or, um, or Milton. <laughs> um, so, so short lyric poetry, it's, it's very condensed. So if you think about a little bit of sugar in the bread dough as compared to a chocolate, so like that. How do I differ in my approach? Well, because novels are long, you have to work at them, but you all know that it's work. A lot of it is just work. You are um, laboring away at it and and um, and people respect that because you look as if you're working. <laughs> we are in a culture that respects people look as if they're working, right? Uh, whereas poets often don't look as if they're working and they can be therefore quite annoying to those around them because somebody will say, why don't you mow the lawns? I'm working. <laughs> but, but you're just looking out the window. Yeah, I'm working. Uh, so like that, I think poetry um, takes place in a much more condensed time frame. It doesn't look like work to those observing it. And um, poets are generally thought of as being weirder than um, novelists are. So I've always felt that I could balance out my weirdness by writing novels. <laughs> Whereas it was just poetry and people did used to say in the 60s, they didn't used to say, um, are you thinking of killing yourself? If you were a woman poet, they were saying, when are you going to kill yourself? <laughs> because you somehow weren't serious unless you did. But that was then, I'm sure it's not true anymore. I would say, can I just say a couple mm -hmm. of things about mm -hmm. the contrast between poetry and novel writing? I started out as a poet um, and uh, have been writing novels for like a, a decade or so. I thought I wasn't the same person long enough to write a novel. And I was, I was pretty sure I, because of that condensed time frame you're talking about, 
I was pretty sure I could be the same person long enough to write a poem. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and and do you still write poems? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> But I do still like look out the window when I'm writing a novel, and and people may not think I'm working. And you yeah, know. but you've got those piles of paper to to show that you are. Mm, true. And the keyboarding that you've been doing. So are are you now the same person long enough to write a novel? Yes. Oh. <laughs> but maybe not a trilogy. I don't know. <laughs> Man. Um, Stuart Phillips, he posed this question to all of you. Uh, Stuart Phillips asks, between the pandemic and our current society, how much further do you have to push to get beyond the realistic? Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, yeah, so, so essentially, I'm sure all of us share this, this feeling. If, if you can think it, somebody's probably done it. Mm. And when you're writing a novel, you really have to tone it down. You have to tone down reality because reality is, is, is so much more over the top once you start delving around in it. You say, oh, surely they didn't. Yes, they did. <laughs> if I put that in a novel, everyone would just say, this is just too, too over the top. It's too melodramatic. It's too exaggerated. It's too harsh. Uh, they would say all those things, and they have. Mm -hmm. I, I tell you what, writing satire has just become <laughs> deathly impossible. <laughs> you know, um, you know the, the 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 abandoned novel, um, abandoned for now novel that I was writing. You know, was uh, was satirical, and uh, you know, um, I had a I had a thing about a guy. Um, when the mass, when people, when the mass mandate started coming down, uh, about you know someone being angry about that and wearing a clan mask to the grocery store, next couple of days that actually happened, <laughs> and I was just like, man, um, you know, what, what am I supposed, to, what am I supposed to do here? Um, so um, yeah, um, I, I I don't know if I, how to uh, how to how to how to solve the problem. I think um, the problem is to just um, you know, just just realize that you're you're gonna be outpaced by reality, and um, <laughs> and you know, and and figure out um, you know, where to get wilder and where to where where to, as, as Marcus said to pull it in because, you know, a lot of times you put something in there, it's, you know, it's, it just looks looks too wild. Mm. Mm. Wow, yeah, I, I'm actually I'm I'm trying to dabble in historical fiction, uh, particularly in the antebellum era, and I was interviewing an historian um and on you know american slavery and i was asking them some questions about you know what all did plantation owners do and he because i didn't i wanted to know my limits and he was like literally anything you can think of most likely someone has done and mm -hmm. so that was that was really damning to hear but it's it's truthful um this question is coming from i'm sorry if i mispronounced your name um Esha Senchahari, she asked, you know, thank you for that discussion on the importance of interrogating utopias. A lot of people use idealism as an antidote to hopelessness. And her question to you all is, is there a happy medium and what does that look like if so? Huh. Um, yes, there is a happy medium. What do, what do the rest of you think? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear part of the question. So what would... Um... People use idealism as an antidote, antidote to hopelessness. Oh, an antidote mm -hmm. um, to hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I think that they, there's a happy medium, and that is, it's a process. It's not an end. Mm. That um, you, you have to keep revisiting your ideals too, and it really helps to get other people's input on on your ideals and rather than just holding them to yourself it's like check with other people what what is this mm -hmm. is am i doing the right thing am i uh causing harm somewhere mm -hmm. undoubtedly. I, I <laughs> sorry undoubtedly undoubtedly one causes yeah. harm somewhere um without knowing it undoubtedly uh, but it might not even be to people it might be to 
tadpoles. True, true. Um, and it's I'm not saying stop if there's harm. I'm saying find out what it is. Yeah. <laughs> that can be an endless process. Yes, um, exactly. That, that's the problem. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a good thing that it's, it's endless. It's endless. Okay, so so just to book book books have endings and life doesn't. Yeah. Lives do, but but life um so far anyway goes on yeah so we think well there should be a happy ending but but that's in books so you can get a you can get a moment where things are pretty good where things are in balance where more people than ever are, are having a decent kind of life uh, you can have moments like that they won't necessarily um last that is that is seems to be uh one thing that happens but just to to have those moments is still pretty good i think so uh, this is from amanda leal this is a question posed to all of you what about speculative fiction as a genre allows you to explore the topics you want that you wouldn't be able to otherwise mm. okay somebody else first <laughs> I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you. I, I think um, I, I like the idea of getting getting outside of uh, outside of a outside of the possible, um, and and that uh, that just allows for a different to reframe your 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 perspective and your your thinking. Um, you know, sometimes we are we are bound by what we think can actually happen. And I found in life that, you know, that's very limited, you know, that's a very, very limited thinking. And uh, what we, what, what we actually think is possible is, is um, what, what, what's, what's really possible and what we think of, you know, or what we think of as possible, you know, are, are, are two completely different things. And so, um, you know, speculative fiction, at least for me, allows me to, to reframe, reframe my mind and, 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 um, and, and get out of myself. Mm. And I would extend that to the past as well. I would say um, that, that speculative fiction, and in particular the branch that I seem to be working in a lot, alternate history, gets me outside of um, just the tyranny of what we supposedly are told, what we're told has supposedly actually happened. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, the future is, is full of potential and the past is full of potential. And so, hey, the present too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the thing about the future is that there isn't one. Um, there isn't one. There are many possible futures, but mm -hmm. there isn't one preordained, uh, fated history that we are, that we are doomed to enact. So the, the future is the futures, possible futures. And if you're writing about a possible future, you're seeing what that would look like if you went down that particular path. So it's like that it's like those plays in which you get you get a series of doors, but you don't know what's gonna be there if you open one of them. But you have to open one. What's it gonna be like? So it, it allows you to, to enact, as it were, and, and live through a possible future. And then you and the reader both uh, can decide what you think about that. Would you like to live in that future? Maybe not. Okay. If not, mm -hmm. take a different path and open a different door. Mm -hmm. And... The next question is from Madison Yost. She says, or she asks rather, how do you actively write about marginalized groups without perpetuating the stigmas and stereotypes surrounding them? What actions do you take to bring light to these issues without further excluding these groups from the human? I just spent uh, 18 hours teaching about this. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, my short and, and somewhat flip but serious answer is buy my book, 
writing the other. <laughs> because that will tell you how to do it. And what did what sort of pushback did you get? Pushback from uh, people who um, think from, that they, from, they don't need to care about this stuff. For, from the students. Oh, what did I get, what pushback did I get from the students? None. They they no. laughed it up. That's good. They did all the mm. exercises. They were very pleased. Yeah. But these were people who already wanted to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's that's oh, I I think that that's something that I'm all, I'm always thinking about because I'm, you know, I'm always writing about uh um, you know, uh, oppression and and that sort of thing. And uh, there was one story in, in my book called Rolling in My Six Foe that um, it, it plays with a whole lot of stereotypes. Um, you know, and my the project of that story is to put the stereotypes there and, and mock them. And um, but I was I was very scared of this story. Um, it took me ten years to to get it right. <laughs> so I think it was just about you know taking time. Um, you know, um, and making sure that um, that things are in their proper context, um, and uh, and and if you're writing outside of your um, outside of your um, outside of your identity, to really be thinking about, um, really be engaging with people outside of um, outside of uh, that that share that identity, whether it be reading their works or or actually knowing them, um, you know. Um, you know, and not thinking that you're coming in as some sort of Superman in order to in order to save them because you're not. <laughs> well, okay, I'll just I'll just say a little thing here that the literary life, if you like, is like a spotlight on a stage, and some people may be in that spotlight. They may be visible. They may be the the um, well-known writers of their time. So in the 50s, they were pretty much all men. Uh, but but they're not the only people in that stage area. There's a lot of other people, but they're in the wings, waiting to come into the spotlight. And when you do come into that spotlight from a marginalized or, or previously um, overlooked non-represented, underrepresented group, you're quite likely to get a lot of criticism from people who belong to that group if you write your characters as human beings with flaws because they will feel, and this happened in the, in the big era of Jewish writing in North America, they will feel that you are criticizing them and they've had enough of that already. So they will feel that you are helping the people who would who would be against them, that you're helping those people by creating characters that have human dimensions and flaws. So I, I think it's a sort of double um, a double burden to bear mm -hmm. uh, that you are going to get some criticism from the very people that you hoped to be representing in a fully human way. Mm -hmm. Does this sound in any way real? It does, and it and and criticism is good. Uh, criticism is is sometimes good, but if the criticism is um, is unrealistic, that is, you should only show one of these uh, people from this group as an angel, a superhuman being, somebody without any um, without any flaws. Um, I don't think that that kind of criticism is is helpful because uh, no, no. all human beings are are fallible. Right, that just perpetuates right. a different stereotype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel Herrera asks, "What? How are you all reading lately? Do you tend to read more recent or super recent works, or is it only me who is perhaps looking for answers for the immediate events?" Um, recent or super recent. Uh, yes, I read some very super recent books. In fact, I read a lot of books that haven't been published yet. Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Let me give you one guess. Uh, blurbing. Blurb. <laughs> yeah, I don't do blurbing. I, I do tweeting, but not blurbing. Okay. Um, 
The difference is that tweeting is publication, so anybody can quote that if they wish, whereas a blurb is a tailored piece written just for uh, that purpose, and, and I would die if I, if I did that because the pile of manuscripts would be this big. Yep. So, in my whimsical godlike way, goddess-like way, I, I, uh, who knows what I may read next? I don't. <laughs> I read uh, both recent and really old things. Um, I read uh, things for blurbing because I do not have your stature, Margaret, and I am like. Uh, I'm warning you. Don't say <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> you, you, no, uh, you, that. no, no, you don't. You don't. You don't. Um, but once in a while, you might. Mm. And, but I also uh, have been reading, um, because I write a column about um, black science fiction authors, uh, it's like the, it's called the, the Crash Course in uh, Black Speculative Fiction or something like that. Can't even remember the name of my own freaking column. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, so I have to read, you know, things like, um, like Martin Delaney's The Huts of America from, from the 19th century and wow. things like that and write about them. Mm. Well, you're going to be super duper well read. Probably. You already are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I read indiscriminately. See, see that bookshelf? I have not read most of those books. <laughs> And oh, so, um, so um, and, 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 you know, and that's just a portion of my books, um, and, you know, and every, every writer has that. So, um, you know, I've, I'm a pile. And so I, I, I read it indiscriminately. I read some blurbs um, and I just, um, yeah, I'm just pulling off and, you know, I, you know, I look at, hey, I read, wrote that, I read, I bought that 10 years ago. I need to read that. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's, that's how I'm at. <laughs> wow. Um, the last question I'm going to ask is from Sarah Klein. Um, she says, thank you all so much for your time tonight. I was curious if you can see any specific tenets that mark your current writing, themes or ideals you find marking all of your work right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to know what they are? <laughs> yes, yes, please, if you'd be so kind. Uh, yes. Um, uh, almost all of my work uh, seems to have to do with community. Uh, with the, um, I'm sort of uh, on a campaign against individualistic writing. Mm. Um, so um, it's all about uh, people working together. Mm -hmm. And does it always work out? Well, no, of course not. That's, <laughs> that's, why, it's, that's why it's a novel. There's <laughs> and, and change, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I, I, I mean, I, one of these things about writing is that I love seeing the patterns emerge, you know, so it's a way of getting to know yourself better. Um, and so, you know, my first book, it was, you know, there were a lot of father, father and, and, and child stories. Um, and that, that doesn't seem to be the case with my, my with, with this second book. Um, you know, I write a lot about rebellion, you know, that, that's, that's, that's always there. Um, but you know, it's, it's about whatever I'm obsessed about is, is what is going to be in there, and my obsessions are going to change um, from from time to time. Mm -hmm. Well, not in, in fiction so much, but I've I've had an awful lot of requests over the past um, year, almost a year. Um, what's it like in the pandemic? I'm, I think you've probably all had those requests too. Mm -hmm. write us a piece about particularly around March, April, May there was a lot of tell us what's going on in your life mm -hmm. um, because of the pandemic but you know what do writers do anyway they sit in a room by themselves and talk to people who aren't there <laughs> it's, not, it's not any different it's just, a lot of people who aren't used to that find themselves doing it <laughs> Wow. We're all writers now. Yeah. <laughs> that way, yes, we are. Wow. Well, Nisi, Rian, Margaret, thank you so much for your time and your insight and your brilliance tonight. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce uh, the executive director, uh, Gwydion Sullivan.
Bye. Hello. Bye. Pleasure, everybody. Good night. It was wonderful. Bye. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our amazing panel of writers for the, the gift of their time tonight. Thank you to our moderator for being here. And most of all, thanks to you, everyone out there, for joining us, because we really couldn't couldn't do this without you. It isn't complete unless you're part of the conversation. Uh, we wouldn't do anything, we couldn't do anything we do without the contributions that you make. So I want to um, drop the uh, link to donate back in the chat just for a second. Uh, and I, I happen to believe that uh, at the moment we're living through now when there's so much that keeps us separated from one another, divided, from viruses to politics to culture wars, the one thing that brings us back together again is, is books. Literature has the power to kind of close the distances between one culture and another, between one person and another. And the right story can make you feel seen and heard and understood, which is why we work really hard to put culturally relevant books into the hands of DC students who don't always have enough access to stories, even in good times, and for whom recent events have made that even more difficult. So even $15 from you can totally transform one young person's reading life. And $15 a month, if you can manage that, helps us do the same thing over and over and over again throughout the year. So thank you so much just for being here, and thank you for anything else you can do for Penn Faulkner. Uh, take care and have a good night.